really happy to be here talking about, um, to moderate this panel 32% and beyond, MIT's role in meeting local and global climate goals. Uh, so climate change, as you, as you heard from this morning's panel, is really a key sustainability challenge. Uh, and I think the panel that we just heard really underscored the fact that climate change is here, it's happening, what can we do? I wanted to sort of um, reflect on something that Larry Suskind said, which was that really we're here about the need for adaptation. Um, and we're talking about mitigation in this panel, and I just wanted to draw attention to the links between mitigation and adaptation. So clearly, climate change is here, and we're looking at a future of climate change. But there's really a fundamental connection. The more mitigation you do, the less adaptation you need. And we're not in a situation that adaptation is really going to help us if we're looking at some of the worst business as usual outcomes. Um, so things that look like a two degree global uh, climate change, which is the global goal that was enshrined in the, in the recent Paris Agreement, are still a substantial amount of climate change. And that's actually a really difficult target to meet globally. Uh, so thinking about how you meet that target is really the focus of, of this panel. Uh, so as I said, the, I'm hoping to introduce a little bit about how our local ideas of how we're reducing greenhouse gases will influence this, this global target. Uh, so the Paris Agreement, which was a, a global agreement on climate change, was negotiated this past December and signed uh, on Earth Day, April 22nd, and sets this two degree goal of global average temperature increase. And sets a sort of aspirational goal of maybe 1.5, because 1.5 degrees is really necessary to preserve some of the low-lying areas, small island states, some of these, these flooding issues. But where are we now? Right now, we're at a business as usual trajectory that's gonna give us about four and a half degrees. What have countries signed up to do? Well, the US has signed up for a pledge that it will reduce its, its greenhouse gases 26 to 28% below 20, 2005 um, by 2025. So at a 2005 baseline, 26 to 28%. Other countries have, have pledged um, as well. And when you add those up, according to the analysis that was done by, by Climate Interactive, you get to about three and a half degrees. Now three and a half degrees is a lot more uh, adaptation than we really want to be doing. Two degrees is a lot more adaptation than we really want to be doing, uh, but still it's better than adapting to three and a half degrees. How do we get there? MIT has pledged 32% by 2030 from two, a 2014 baseline, uh, but has established that this is a floor, not a ceiling. And I think that's really important because when we think about how temperature responds to carbon, the total, it's the total amount of carbon you emit that matters. So if we're on this trajectory, towards a higher temperature goal, we're essentially just using up our carbon sooner. And that just advances the time at which, if we're gonna stay within two degrees, we have to go to decarbonization. So we're thinking about, if we're staying to that two degree goal, getting to zero. And that's a big challenge and it's a big step change between thinking about 32% goals and thinking about bending a curve into a zero carbon future. So this is really what, um, what I think this, this panel has really great expertise to, to speak to specifically as thinking about how do we get from the goals we have now and the, the next five, 10, 15 years into where we need to be in order to maintain even that two degree increase over the longer term. Uh, so I'm really happy to introduce our, our three panelists who have very different perspectives on, on climate goals from, from the global uh, all the way down to the MIT scale. Um, our first panelist is uh, Ron Prin. He's a professor of atmospheric science in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. He also directs the Center for Glo Global Change Science, and he co-directs the Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. 
I'm going to talk about lowering the risks of climate change and the greenhouse gamble, as, as uh, I have dubbed it uh, and my, I and my colleagues uh, a decade or so ago, and the challenge of two degrees centigrade, which um, uh, Noel has already uh, talked about. So what, what, are, what are some of the big global threats? Uh, obviously, in the panel this morning, you were looking at local threats and so on. So one of the things going on today, and it's happening in, in real time, is the depletion of Arctic summer sea ice. We're replacing a reflecting with an absorbing surface in the Arctic. That's speeding up the warming of the Arctic. We have instability of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. I'll say more about that and just what that Im implies for possible sea level rise. And that is very scary, that amount, uh, for, compared to the ones that you would want to think about for defending Cambridge and uh, the MIT campus. The deep ocean carbon and heat sink, which slows down the rate of warming at the present time, uh, lots of scientific reasons to expect that it will slow down and maybe even collapse, uh, and that will accelerate warming again. The Arctic tundra and permafrost, uh, if you warm up the Arctic too much, you will melt it, no, no surprise, and there's an enormous amount of carbon stored in the permafrost, and it will come out as methane and carbon dioxide and so on, another scary uh, outcome. Ocean acidity, uh, as it gets more and more acidic, calcium carbonate shelled uh, organisms, that uh, phytoplankton that sit at the base of all life in the sea, uh, get threatened. Uh, and the greater the acidity, the greater the threat. Shifting climate zones may be the biggest single thing that, that sh everyone should be worried about. We can retreat to some degree for some countries from the coastal regions, but when whole climate zones shift, and we take into account that we live in countries, we're not all in one huge country where we can sort of migrate here and there. We all know the perils of, of forced migration uh, and the desperate uh, nature of that. We are gonna face that unless we really address mitigation uh, here in a very big way. And finally, the increasing destructiveness of typhoons, hurricanes, and so on. And this, of course, does come back to to uh, this community here, we all remember Sandy, or the, the folk a little, little south of here remember it much uh, more than we do, but there's nothing stopping Sandy's coming up the coastline more and more in the future, and we're going to have to think along those lines. So that's just my little thing to start out to, to get you scared, but I know everyone here is, regards this as, as really important. So what we've done uh, at MIT in the past couple of uh, decades in the Global Change Joint Program is that we've formed a model of the integrated global system model. It couples the human, uh, specifically economic system, and the earth or environmental system in ways that are not matched by any other type of model uh, in the world. So just to give you an idea, so it's a huge computer model. A uh, large number of people involved in the various uh, disciplines, sub-disciplines in creating this model. It models all the major national economies and trading between them. It, it um, includes detailed energy and non-energy sector treatments. It con considers all greenhouse gas emissions by nation and sector. On the science side, the greenhouse gas and air pollutant chemical cycles are included. The climate response to greenhouse gases is, is included and the impacts of climate and air pollution change on the global environment. That includes, of course, health as well as natural ecosystems. What are the big uncertainties uh, in going forward? Well, there are big uncertainties in making economic projections into the future and big uncertainties in making climate projections into the future. For climate, these uncertainties are driven by a lack of really detailed knowledge of, of uh, how clouds and convection work in a warming world. Secondly, how the ocean overturning circulation, that's really important as a carbon and heat sink, how that's going to behave in the future. And thirdly, how aerosols, suspended particles that we produce in very large amounts, how do they affect the properties of clouds and rainfall going forward? Uh, there are a similar set of uh, long list to do with economic projections uh, that I won't uh, belabor here. So we take a probabilistic approach to forecasting climate, because you shouldn't believe any one single projection. Don't believe it. This is particularly important for local uh, studies to say you, you need a, a range of possibilities to, to plan to. 
So we do, for each policy choice, we do 400 runs of this model. We begin in 1750, go through to the present, check agreement with observations, and launch forward with different but equally probable assumptions about uncertain parameters and structures in the economic section and the environmental section of the integrated global system model. So I'm going to show you now a way of projecting uh, those uh, um, forecasts in a way that can be understood by, I think, most people. Uh, you put probability distribution functions in front of somebody and they glaze over immediately. And if you're doing it on a plane, they try to look around for a seat other than the one next to me. <laughs> so I, we had a real desire to uh, come up with various ways to show this. So here is a wheel. We call it the greenhouse gamble wheel. And this is a wheel with no policy but through, the word, uh, through 2100. To give you a sense of what that means, it means we'll get to about 1,330 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2100. To calibrate that, we're currently at 490. Okay? So this is what happens if we just blindly, and of course we won't. I mean, the, the, the implications of looking at this wheel uh, double these numbers approximately for polar temperatures. This is for the global average, and the way the climate system works, the poles work warm much faster. So here it is, and if you want to be below three degrees, forget about two degrees that Noel introduced you to, if you want to be below three degrees, if you spin this wheel, you've got to land in that little blue sliver. Right? That's where you need to land. So that's a gamble, obviously, we should not take. So let's just go and say, well, why, why don't we go to about half the greenhouse gas levels that were in the no policy case? That's, and, and very easy to do. We're at 490 parts per million now, so lots of room. Right? And ask, you know, what does that do right? in, a, in, a, in, a, in a probabilistic approach to this? And that is this wheel. It's a new wheel with low odds of extremes. And now you can see greater than 3 degrees centigrade is that light green slice. Everything else is below that. And then now you even see some possibilities for one and a half degrees centigrade or so, and that, that would be uh, certainly, you know, that's the blue, dark blue, might sit in there, and certainly two degrees, and so on. You'd look at this and say, wow, even doing something relatively modest does make a difference, right? So here is the wheel that we are currently gambling, even with Paris as the pledges and so on. There were two things went on in Paris. There were the pledges, and then there was the, the aim of a bigger goal, right? And it's not understood. The pledges don't reach the bigger goal, right? The bigger goal being two degrees and perhaps even uh, one and a half. That's aspirational at the present time. So if I asked looking at this, uh, these uh, spinning wheels, even with a right-hand wheel, there's 80% chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade above 1990 and 97% chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial. So that wheel, as good as it looks, if 2 degrees is, is the threshold, then we're in trouble uh, if we think we can be settled with uh, 660. So this leads to the 2 degree challenge. And let me just say a, a few things very quickly about what underlies that, uh, this. It was actually proposed decades ago by the European Union. It's not fully realized that it was proposed a long time ago, but not taken seriously until the last few years. So the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, did a lot of work uh, on uh, this threshold and came to the conclusion, this is paraphrasing a much, much longer set of paragraphs, that this 2 degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit between pre-industrial, roughly 1875 and the year 2100, as a threshold above which the damages globally to human and natural systems due to climate change begin to become e economically and ethically less and less tenable. Sea level rise is a really good example of what we would worry about with 2 degrees. 2 degrees centigrade global average is 4 degrees centigrade polar temperatures. Now we know from the ice core record what sea level was roughly uh, the last time the, the poles were 4 degrees centigrade warmer than they are at the present time. And that occurred in the Eemian period as it's called, 116,000, 129,000 years ago. 
And at that point, the estimated global sea levels were 5 to 10 meters, or 16 to 32 feet higher than present. And the trigger, obviously, is 4 degrees centigrade polar warming. That's what it does. How quickly we get to that stage, to some degree, doesn't matter. That is a very, very serious threat. So I've already mentioned that. It will not be easy. We are already about one degree centigrade above pre-industrial because of the new record warmest year set last year in 2015. So if you read the plan for action on climate change, which I think most of you are very familiar with, you'll see there that there is a uh, meeting the, the challenge of two degrees centigrade is something that uh, we are um, aiming to get done. There'll be two parts to that, understanding the key individual elements involved in the challenge and integrating the science, technology, economics, and policy to meet that challenge. Task two will, of course, be done with the integrated global system model. So very quickly, a quick picture of what this two degrees challenge looks like if we do some preliminary calculations. So what we've done is we've put a price uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. They begin at, uh, depending on the, the, the response of the climate system to a given amount of greenhouse gases, we have to take that into account. The uncertainty in the climate response to a given amount of greenhouse gases makes this far more difficult because we don't really know the emissions that are going to achieve the two degrees centigrade target, so we've got to take them all into account. So the idea is, if it's high response, you're going to have to start lowering emissions faster. If it's low response, slower. If it's median, and so on. So we're in this unknown territory, and you really have to take that into account, and then argue, what do you do under those circumstances? So here is uh, what it looks like for those three low climate response, median climate response, and high climate response. The vertical axis is, uh, is a equivalent of a carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, including all greenhouse gases, and you can see that we've got to limit greenhouse gases to less than 500 parts per million if we have high climate response. Uh, median, it's a bit higher. Low, it's higher. Are we going to gamble on the fact that maybe the low climate response is correct? That's a gamble. That's an example of a gamble. So we've taken all three, and we have to put a higher and higher price on when, he, when you want to lower the, em the emissions to get to a target that's lower and lower. So naturally, because it was uh, sorted out in the modeling system, we achieved the two degrees centigrade target uh, in uh, 2100, and in fact, we begin to go down from that uh, after that, uh, heading towards uh, one and a half, but that goes through to the year 2100, 2300, sorry. So it's just very quickly, this is what it looks like for the transformation of, of the energy system. Low response means I don't have to go to renewables, hydro, nuclear, and so on as quickly uh, as I might. If it's median, I have to go uh, more and more to uh, renewables, hydro, nuclear. And then if it's high response, uh, I need to go very, very fast uh, to essentially a system dominated by renewables, hydro, nuclear. Carbon capture and sequestration is, uh, is a big challenge, by the way. If you can do that, you can use fossil fuels to, uh, to achieve that. You can also look at it as a huge safety valve. If you have carbon capture and sequestration and you generate electric power with bu burning biomass, electric power, you can create a gigatons per year sink. And it would be really nice to have that in our in our quiver of arrows. Uh, so carbon capture and sequestration is something that I personally feel uh, we should be working very, very hard on in addition to all of the other great things going on. You'll notice that if it's low response, uh, that we go rise to 500 exajoules per year of, uh, in, in the top graph. And then if it's median, we go to 400. And then if it's uh, high response, we've got to get that um, uh, energy consumption down to 350. What achieves that? Energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is one of the most important things we can do in mitigation is go for energy efficiency. In other words, stop wasting the energy that we do produce. I, I should say in the overall pictures here, the developed nations have got to decrease substantially their uh, uh, use of energy overall to make room 
frankly, for the developing countries to uh, develop their economy. So it's going to have to be a sharing of the, of, of the globe in that respect. All right, and, and uh, so this is a, I'll just put this up very quickly and we can, you can take a quick look at these. Here are some of the, the important issues uh, about the two degree challenge, uh, just from my own viewpoint at the present time. It's, it's indeed feasible in my view, but the technological, economic, and political channel challenges are very large. Let me emphasize one thing. These low emitting technologies have got to be affordable in poor countries for them to be globally implemented. There's a price challenge as well as a technology challenge. We've got to have the technologies there. They've got to be feasible. They've got to work. But over time, they've got to get to be lower and lower and lower cost to achieve this. In other words, will people in India be able to afford them? Will the average person in India? It is not just simply the market is not in California or in Massachusetts. We have to be cognizant of the fact that we've got to drive those prices down uh, globally. Um, there are a few other things up here. I'm going to uh, uh, stop at this point. Um, I, I certainly agree uh, adaptation should be going on in concert with mitigation, but that, in my, my view, is sort of the low-hanging fruit. We've got to grab that low-hanging fruit and defend where we can, but we must face this mitigation uh, challenge uh, <coughs> above all. MIT ought to just go uh, uh, beyond the immediate plans to lower greenhouse gas emissions the challenge I would put for the MIT and, uh, is to say, when will MIT go to zero net emissions as a campus? In other words, go and show that it can be done. And you do it, you don't do it in a crash program because you can't afford it. But on what time frames can we see that maybe it's 2050, 2060 or whatever, that MIT, way before the rest of the world needs to, to be there, MIT has achieved it. And I think that would be a great challenge for us all to say, how do we get there then? How do we get there to be zero net emissions before we expect the rest of the world in total to be there because the developing countries have got to be taken into account. Those of you who travel internationally, as I do, and into developing countries, you look and say, these people are living hand to mouth. Uh, how do you get them into this uh, grand uh, vision? Thanks. Thank you, Ron. You've given us a great sense of the, the global challenge and the degree of that challenge. Um, and you've set up a great question for our next two speakers. Uh, when will MIT go to zero net emissions? Uh, so Steve Lanou is the deputy director of MIT's Office of Sustainability. Uh, Steve helped to establish the Office of Sustainability in 2013, uh, but he's been at MIT longer than that. He's been leading campus sustainability efforts um, since 2005 when he was at the um, EHS headquarters office um, and before moving to the Office of Sustainability. Uh, so can you answer this question for us, Steve? Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. And Ron, thank you particularly for teeing up the challenge and helping us draw from the global scale down to very much where we live and work. Um, and so I'm going to lay out a little bit about um, sort of what the challenge is here right on campus in terms of if we're, um, as a campus, going to try to reduce our emissions um, as part of that mitigation effort while there's also the adaptation activities that are going on. We have to understand what it is that we're talking about. What are we um, measuring so that we can manage? Um, and while I hope not to punt the question of how are we going to get there to Joe, who's going to speak uh, afterwards about sort of a trajectory or a plan um, recognizing that it's going to be iterative, um, I want to lay out sort of what that size of the pie is that we are all, all need to focus on here um, regardless of where we sit. Um, there's really opportunity in every, every department, uh, lab, or center uh, and also at the individual level. So as we begin to look at our own campus, we have to understand what the systems are that we have on campus and what are the sources of those emissions that we're talking about reducing. 
We recognize that 32% is that floor, not that ceiling. That in order to get to that, um, to keep that um, change at two, at two degrees, as Ron and Noel talked about, we need to start somewhere. And so this commitment of 32% by 2030 is really that first step to get us all pulling in the same direction. There are a lot of us, a lot of you, who have been doing, um, who have been planning and implementing, but now we have a clear sort of call to pull in the same direction. And so we have to understand what that direction um, should be targeting. So when we talk about reducing our emissions, at this point we're talking about the greenhouse gas emissions associated essentially with all of the activities that we do daily on this campus. It's the energy that we're using in our buildings, it's the fuels that we're using in our power plant, it's the fuel that's being used in our transportation uh, vehicles here on campus. They're the, they're the chemicals, the gases that we're purchasing that are used in some of our research, in some of our electrical systems on campus. There are the emissions that we're emitting here directly on campus. That's our primary focus here in Cambridge, and I'll talk that through in just a little bit. But we also are looking at the electricity that we purchase, right? These are our indirect emissions, but they're happening because we are purchasing the electricity that's coming onto campus, and that's an important piece. And in this round of our goal, we're also including the, our lease space that we lease uh, for MIT academic purposes. So that is uh, essentially an acknowledgement of the fact that we are renting some space to fulfill our academic mission, but we're gonna acknowledge that and help understand what the scale of that is so that we don't go um, and look to have a strategy that is uh, leasing, leasing our way out of this problem. So we're, we're creating, um, we're capturing that space as well. So again, it's about what we're doing really on campus every day, how we're, how we're getting uh, around campus, how we are using energy on campus, and what are we using, what are we purchasing on campus. And we recognize that um, an institution's greenhouse gas footprint is not limited to this scope that I'm gonna talk about here, about this scope one, these direct emissions, but it will grow as we get better data, as we get better systems of collecting and understanding what that impact is, moving down the value chain or up the value chain, looking at the carbon emissions associated, which we're not doing today in this inventory, such as the emissions associated with our business travel, right? People know, people have looked at it. Um, it may be, it's quite substantial. Looking at the emissions associated with how we're driving to or commuting to campus is another piece that in the future we're gonna to look to grow as the data becomes better um, and as the approaches for measuring become more standardized. So our current baseline of 2014 is really, is looking right now at our Cambridge academic um, community essentially. It's not including our real estate spaces. It's not including Lincoln Lab, Endicott House, Haystack, Bates, uh, or our high performance computing center but we will be measuring all of those. And as I say, as we develop our process to secure sort of a good protocol for bringing them in, we will. So a quick snapshot, I don't think it's any surprise. Um, when we're looking at putting a bubble over our own campus understanding where those emissions are, 96% essentially of our baseline is coming from the energy that's, that's used and supplied to our buildings our heating, our cooling, our electricity. Not a surprise, but I think the scale of it is uh, illuminating for a lot of people. But this recognizes um, that there are a number of avenues that we can take to start uh, addressing the, the challenges of the energy use in those buildings, and, and Joe will talk a little bit uh, about that. Again, vehicles, process gases. So I think all of us will have a role in thinking about what are the best ways, what are the best strategies for reducing emissions in those areas. Um, we have a history, so we're gonna look at um, sort of a trajectory of where we've been, I think is important for showing us what's possible and giving us, I think, the encouragement in identifying some of the solutions that will help us get to that 32% and beyond. So if we were to just jump forward to, to uh, the most recent year, past our deadlines, 20, uh, our, our, our baseline, 
and looking at 2015, we were successful in reducing emissions. Largely, we've, we've, we've looked at, at the emissions reductions between last year and this year and have identified squarely that energy efficiency played a, a, a gigantic role in that through structured programs with our utilities, through wholesale retrofits across campus, and that show that that's a significant opportunity and there's more, there's more to be done in that space. Um, so, as I said, sort of looking, looking back to look forward, uh, I think it's encouraging looking at our past and understanding that um, choices matter. Uh, we had an opportunity to do a greenhouse gas inventory back to 1990 with the help of many of you in this room and a student at the time, which really highlighted um, some very sort of key, key phases essentially in our recent, recent past here on campus, showing the impacts in 1995 of cogeneration, the impacts of sort of unbridled growth without a focus on how we're building our new buildings to a point where we had an inflection and we're designing buildings. Remember, we can't build our way out of this, but we're building buildings more efficiently. We're investing in energy efficiency. So you can see in 2006, sort of the reflection of mitigating the, the rate of growth from new facilities, um, which is essentially offset by the energy efficiency investments that MIT made. And then looking at that last dip over the past two years, after that last period, shows that we can change the trajectory. And our hope is that this is the new phase of some climate leadership that we're going to, we have to maintain so sort of that downward curve out to 2030 and beyond. And just as a simple schematic about the magnitude that we have to do simply for 32 percent is going to be a series of activities. There's no silver bullet. And essentially what we've learned is we have to move on all directions simultaneously. So Joe will help fill in some of those slices, but we recognize that we know what some of those strategies might be and that there are also some that we, we don't know. And there's going to have to be advances in the labs, in the centers, in the classrooms that are coming out that we can help apply, test on campus. But we all on this, on this campus level have this opportunity to help discover what those solutions are going to be because everybody is going to have to make some contribution to these reductions. And if MIT is sort of a large research institution, can't figure out how to do that, then the chances of success are much less. And so People ask, how important is it for MIT to reduce its own emissions when it's really just a drop in the bucket? We recognize that. But if the solutions that we can apply within our power plant, within our buildings, within our vehicles, if we can figure out how to do more with less, then we can help figure out what those strategies are going to be and hopefully scale them beyond our own campus to have an impact. And so that's really the challenge that we all have heard and internalized um, in that what we do, we have to think about the scalability of those solutions that we're doing on campus to apply outside and that resonates with our faculty, with our staff and students. So that's where we stand, that's what we need to do, that's where we need to get to. Um, and all of us are gonna have a role to play. I remember after one of our recent Lunch and Learn on this topic with staff was a, an observation that there was a, a hunger to know what they can do. What can I do? And <clears throat> there is something in this for everybody. As I said, everybody is a occupant, user um, on the space, in this space. So with that, I'm done. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve, for helping bring that, that global picture down to our campus and then um, our roles as individuals. Uh, our next speaker, Joe Higgins, is the Director of Infrastructure Business Operations under the Office of Executive Vice President and Treasurer. He's currently coordinating greenhouse gas reduction efforts uh, and pursuing renewable energy procurement and installation strategies across the campus. Joe.
Thank you, Noel, and, uh, and, and thanks to Julie and Steve for uh, asking me to be uh, here today. It's, it's really great to connect with everyone um, on this panel especially and sustainability thinking and how we think about it in terms of our operations and our respective academic areas. Um, it's, it's everybody in this room whose passion and uh, subject matter expertise over the last several years um, really has led to significant headway um, on this path uh, to, to reducing our admissions um, and to even meeting and exceeding the, the, the aggressive 32% re reduction goal that we have um, in front of us. So, so what does this path currently look like for us today. So I've been asked to take a few minutes um, and, and kind of lay out the math and summarize where we are um, and where we think we're going in coordinating and operationalizing uh, our collective greenhouse gas reduction efforts. So it's, it's a very good story. Um, we're implementing on each and every one of these uh, today and, and we're making some pretty significant progress. So as you can see, our path is a combination of many different strategies being implemented by the many different working groups uh, with us here today. Now, keep in mind, it is a path. There are rocks and, and rubble in, you know, in the road. It is not a highway, it is not a paved road. <laughs> but, but our path primarily focuses on, on these three dimensions. So the first dimension is improving the efficiency of our energy production, our energy supply, and our central utility plant. And that is, how do we continue to make less carbon intensive energy less intensive than what we buy from our local utility company? The second dimension, and we've heard a lot about it in the previous discussions, is reducing the energy that we all use, that we use in each and every one of our buildings every day. And there's many efforts in progress here, um, and we'll unpack this a little bit in a few minutes in terms of the many things that are in play. And the third dimension is growing renewables. So once you've straightened out your energy supply and you've gotten your demand as low as you can, this is the next step. So we're looking at renewables both on our campus and off of our campus. So renewable strategies are one of the things that really connect us as MIT and our research mission to the community and the country and, and, and internationally. Um, renewables definitely will help us contribute much more broadly than just beyond our four walls and our own 32% reduction. So what you can see here in front of you is the impact of these three focus areas. So walking left to right, starting with our 2014 baseline of 204,000 metric tons, we're gonna to be adding to this baseline. So we are growing on our program growth at this point in sort of the modest scenario. We're gonna be adding about 10% of program growth over the next 14 years. This includes Nano and Kendall, um, and many other planned building additions and, and lab renovations over the years. Now, the good news is we anticipate that the majority of this future growth will be offset. It's gonna be offset from the CEP enhancements that are underway today. So the central energy plant enhancements, the design is nearly complete. Uh, the turbines uh, are being purchased as we speak. Um, and the expanded CEP capacity will be coming online in 2020. So that's gonna give us an absolutely huge leg up. Now, how many folks in the room today have contributed to the, the central energy plant, whether in concept or design, or the review of the specifications from the faculty side on, on the turbines? Can we just can kind of get a show of hands? All right, quite, quite, quite a few folks. So it's a fabulous project, and it is one that is inspiring our broader, broader community and, and our peers. And many of you may have seen the, the recent National Geographic article highlighting MIT going big with microgrids. So there's four huge key benefits for this. The first benefit is resiliency. So our ability to use this CEP as a backup energy source to keep this, uh, this uh, research engine of MIT running. It has the benefit of very favorable economics in keeping our energy costs low. It has the benefit of reducing our greenhouse gas in a very significant way. But the biggest benefit is that this CEP is our bridge. It's our bridge to the future energy economy, where the newest energy source yet to be identified and probably identified on this campus can be plugged into our campus when it's commercially viable. Second, perhaps the most influential efforts underway today are efforts directly related to reducing the energy use in our buildings. These efficiency gains include a culmination of work, as Steve has explained, over many, many years. And in six areas is where we're making the impact. 
So it's our ongoing reinvestment in our infrastructure and renewal of our existing buildings. It's our recommissioning efforts in how we continue to tune up our most energy intensive buildings. It's how we continue to incorporate sustainable uh, design practices from our very smallest to our most large projects. Ongoing targeted investments in our efficiency forward program with the local utility companies. And our most MIT this perfect example is uh, our Green Labs uh, efforts that are underway. And there's many, many other things that folks uh, in the room are working at. And just to give an example of that, how many folks in this room are actively engaged in amplifying these efforts around building efficiency across the board for MIT? Can you see your hands, get them all up there? So, so probably more than three quarters of the room. So this is by far the largest coordination effort uh, that is underway and happening. It's all sweat equity. This is the hardest part of the work, but it all has the most meaningful contribution in terms of the environment, our mission, and, and, and our broader community impact. So how does this play out numbers-wise? Together, we believe we can achieve even more than the projected 8 to 12% that you see up here. Um, and it's really predicated upon the enabling efforts that we're putting in place over the next several months and years. The first enabling piece is making it the primary responsibility of, of the folks that are working on these projects. It's got to be much more than a part-time effort. And we're working to get that incorporated into their responsibilities and freeing them up to do this good work. The second is enabling the financial resources and the mechanisms that advance and accelerate these efforts and efficiency projects. It could be the revolving loan fund, but it could also be having the steering committee in which we receive uh, monthly approvals for the efforts that many of you bring forward. And the third, and I know Tony talked a little bit about this this morning, is enabling behavior change with all of our building users, changing the minds and hearts of the people that are in our buildings. And just three quick examples come to mind. It's how do you accommodate time and temperature setbacks in our buildings so that they're not just cooking 24 hours a day? How do we use our space more efficiently so that we don't have to continue to build more space? Um, and adopting the leading airflow management strategies, which I know many of the folks here um, are working at. So for on-site renewable opportunities, uh, we anticipate a 1% to 3% reduction with the best available solar technologies available to us today. So MIT currently has four solar rooftop installations totaling about 100 kilowatts. We've also identified another 70 roofs where solar power generation is possible. However, even with the most advanced technology today and the available square footage of all of our rooftops, uh, the best case we could generate probably 3% of MIT's total energy use and needs. And this is typical. Ask anyone in an urban environment, and 1 to 3% is the number that they'll tell you. They've done the, the studies extensively. And, and Tay is going to be sharing a little bit more with us on that a little bit later this afternoon. So how do we close the gap? To 32% and beyond, we are currently evaluating um, options for large-scale, off-campus renewable solutions and how quickly we can get there. We're evaluating options that add significant capacity to the grid, either with solar or wind capacity. And we're adding it in a way, or hope to add it in a way, that credibly offsets our emissions. So we're not just going to be buying our way out of things with buying racks or offsets or anything like that, but we're going to do it in a way that provides long-term electric price stability for MIT for decades to come. We're going to do it in a way that provides access for educational research um, and, and uh, student access for these large-scale installations, because that's where the game is currently being played. And we're going to do it in a way that promotes innovative market financing structures for others out there in the industry to learn and adopt at large scale. We're looking to spur action with these creative financing mechanisms that others can bring to the bear. So all of these efforts in large scales, our hope will have a much broader impact on the local, regional, and national level, much more than just on our campus. So we're currently evaluating many of these solutions regionally. Some are very, very compelling. Some are very large on the East Coast, the Northeast, and across the US, where MIT can develop our own, or we can partner and go with others. It is a partnering solution opportunity. So we look forward to working together with everyone here on these emerging renewable opportunities um, as we continue along this reduction path. So in closing, I, our path um, would not exist nor have the success it would have with, without everyone here in this room today. As you saw by the show of hands, everyone is, is involved on this. Um, we're looking forward to taking these steps together 
um, adjusting our thinking as we need to and as, as technology evolves as it is ever so quickly. And also to applauding everyone's accomplishments as we continue to make headway um, in these reduction areas across the boards, across the board. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Fernandez. Um, I'm a professor in architecture. So, um, I, first of all, I applaud the work that's being done on buildings and, and generally carbon emissions reductions on campus. We're, we're clearly at a very special time here at MIT. Um, but I wanna, I, I'd, I'd like to try to make a connection between the climate science and the, the technologies and strategies towards um, arriving at a decarbonized campus at some point. So on the efficiency side, I, th I think um, I, I remembered, and then I just checked just now, that the first IPCC report, Working Group 3, noted efficiency as critical to any um, achievements in dramatically reducing carbon emissions globally. Uh, subsequent reports then got closer and closer to highlighting what particular economic sectors could contribute most, and buildings really emerged as a, as a major player. On this campus, it seems to me that the smartest dollar would be in reducing energy consumption and therefore um, carbon emissions on buildings as we build them. And since new house is likely to be substantially renovated or raised and uh, we'll get a new dorm out of that, and there'll be other new dorms. Why aren't we saying that we will build net zero energy dorms beginning next year? I totally agree, let's, let's move forward. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree, and I think we're talking about, again, changing minds and hearts. So if we're gonna have a conversation about new residence halls, are we gonna talk about air conditioning? Are we gonna air condition our new residence halls? Is that something that new students are, are going to be looking for? So it's, it's hard to be talking about new air conditioning and net zero in the same uh, breath. So I, again, it, it is possible. There are many campuses out there that show net zero is possible, but you are gonna have some energy use in the building and you're either gonna have to offset that some way with, uh, with renewables. That's sort of the current strategy, but as we see, there are gonna be evolving strategies that we could take advantage of. But, but it is always part of the conversation how can we make it net zero, zero? I know our design teams grapple with that every day. We work with fantastic partners that have done it, and, and it is part of the thinking. You can be sure that as these renovations, new constructions are taking place, that we're going to be designed to squeeze as much of that energy down as we possibly can. And to Joe's point, then we're going to have to look elsewhere on campus and beyond campus to squeeze out that last bit. And what I would like to see is us taking a specific building as a project, making it higher profile, really zero in on what can be done, and let's engage the multitude of the community to figure out how much we can drive that down, what can we embed within the building that can be generative, and let's open it up as an experiment. I mean, let's get the input and visibility and accountability to really experiment on a building. So I think we, will gonna see, we are seeing those new strategies and recognizing that we have to look at the campus as a portfolio. Like as we add buildings or add air conditioning, that means we're gonna have to do lifting somewhere else, and we will. I would just like to add to that that there is a lot of discussion in Mind Tant Hard and other places about um, many, dorm, many colleges have uh, increase their wellness dorm, they have specific wellness dorms and uh, dorms where their residences are fo more focused on that and I would encourage a connection of those conversations between personal wellness and the wellness of uh, those residents on the planet and for MIT. I, I would certainly, would certainly would agree. And I think as we need to make sure that we get the, the people, the right people and programs at the right points to talk about, well, what is the physical environment gonna be in this? How is this design where we are gonna spend 50, 60% of our time in, how can we make those spaces not only regenerative possibly for energy, but for our well-being? So yes, we want to, we need to. Um, and these new design processes are really, will be bringing in those additional 
voices to make sure that those spaces are accomplishing the most that they can. I have a question about what other campuses and universities are doing. We've studied uh, in some of our committees other reports and sustainability plans. Uh, the one that resonated with me most was probably UBC Vancouver, and we had an opportunity to speak with them. I'm just curious of the other plans that are out there that you've looked at. What in particular do you think other people are doing right, doing wrong, and what do you think we can learn from them? Stanford's been in the news quite a bit. They had a significant reinvestment in powering their campus um, to a point that they have essentially taken the majority of fossil fuels off of their campus and moving to an all-electric system. Um, <clears throat> of course, when <clears throat> people learn about it here on campus, it's how come MIT is not doing that? And to MIT's credit, we put a team together to go out there with people in this room. And I think many of us thought, well, that's California, that's Stanford, that's, that's not New England, that's not Cambridge. We're not going to be able to accomplish any of those, um, that level of magnitude. And the technology that's being deployed there may not be appropriate or even feasible here. But with I think, concerted effort and since studying and using models that they used, we discovered that there are opportunities to use components of that technology, not at the same scale, but here. And recognizing that um, improvements in, the, in our distribution systems, taking greater advantage of, of, of heat recovery, improving our distribution systems, um, can offer opportunities that we may not have, have looked at, that we're going to have to sort of scale over time. And so I think really what we took away was, was that there, there's a lot of, there's work that can be done now to prepare for a time when our grid is as reliable as aspects at the Stanford campus um, so that we can make similar sort of a, uh, transformations of improving our, our distribution systems. Yeah. So, so, so I can just add, you know, of other, you know, universities out there, um, you know, I think they're, they have that three-pronged approach that we have. Get your supply sources as efficiently as you can. Use as least amount of energy as you possibly can. And then look to renewables. Uh, the city of Boston has a 50% emissions reduction by 2050. City of Cambridge has an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050. Everybody agrees. College, university, higher education officers, finance officers say, we are not going to get there without a large-scale renewable solution somewhere in our region that would offset, you know, kind of our growth metrics. So, so it has to be all three, but I think that increasingly institutions with these very aggressive goals are saying large-scale renewables are going to have to play a role, until which time there is an alternate decarbonized source available that you can plug into your central utility infrastructure. Yeah, I just wanted to add another dimension to this uh, when you talk about other universities. What about universities in developing countries and the, the extent to which we could have a partnership to say, as we see some low-cost uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, solutions, that uh, we have a partner somewhere else to, to provide a paradigm for developing countries to say, well, some of these things should be translated into universities in developing countries as a nice transfer of, of ideas and particularly if they are low cost. And I'm sure part of these energy efficiency solutions are relatively low cost. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in and say, I, I definitely agree with you, Maureen, as part of that, that task force, that it does seem like we are a little bit behind on our peer universities. But I would say that when we're thinking about the global picture, everyone is very behind. So we all need to, need to catch up. I, I think most of us take the idea that Ron presented that pricing of carbon is going to be necessary in order to have some uh, impact on changing behavior. I don't understand why we don't apply that to the campus. If students had to pay much higher rents for space when they wanted the air conditioning turned on or they were willing to take units that had no air conditioning, they would be making a choice. If departments could keep the savings because they worked as a unit, 
whether how the faculty traveled to work, whether how they managed, if you could, get the data on how much energy was in saved, not comparing them to each other in absolute use, but in terms of saving, and reallocated that saving back to the departments, and create a competition about who can save more relative to the things they can control, we would be taking the pricing idea and applying it within the campus. Otherwise, it sounds like every decision about a dorm is made once, and we hope somebody made a smart decision, and that's that. And I know you can do experiments, but what about experiments with pricing inside the campus? I, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one wants to tax the bad thing, which is greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, lower costs elsewhere, and put more money in the person who's obviously paying, paying for greenhouse gas emissions they're responsible for. The, my only comment would be, depending on what building you're in, in at MIT, getting down to the departmental level might be a little bit difficult, but certainly at the at the uh, MIT level over, I'm in the green building, you see. <laughs> and it's not very green. Uh, <laughs> but at the, at the MIT wide, why not? And it's a good lesson in market economics. Uh, you, know, tax, you know, tax the bad thing and, and lower costs uh, on the good thing uh, is, is the general economic principle. And there are people in this room who are developing tools to look at a cost of carbon and capital planning and looking at what the implications of those costs might be to influence decisions, very much as, a, as an experiment, um, to see how might we account for some of those additional costs and what impact, better understand what that impact of that additional growth is. And so that's the, be, that's the beginning of, of an experiment here on campus. Um, and to your point about economic signaling of charging users for space and energy is, shouldn't be off the table. And those are sort of those, those hard conversations that we have to have as a, as a campus that um, we in the operations side of the house are willing to sort of feel some pain and try to, re and, and work to reduce emissions, but there's only so much and only so far that we are going to get that at some point we're gonna have to have that conversation about, um, as Joe alluded to, how do we as a, as, as a community want to access our buildings? Do we want to have them 24-7? And that there may be, there's going to be others who need to, to join in the uh, sort of hard questions about how do we want to allocate our costs um, and make decisions. Leon Glixman, um, I'm in the Department of Architecture and Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I struggled through this issue of campus energy for many years before the sustainability program where we tried as sort of a volunteer effort to the campus energy task force to do something. Um, and, and I agree with what you're saying. I think the most important thing in near term is the issue of energy efficiency. Part of it is the issue of behavioral, and just as a particular example of it, we're standing in this room here, uh, south facing windows, lots of daylight, and all the lights are on. Uh, and we could at least think about ways of dimming the lights and still have adequate uh, uh, comfort. But again, no one thinks about that. On a larger scale, if we're really honest about improving the efficiency of the campus, it's the efficiency of the laboratories. That's where the primary energy is being used on this campus, and it's the biggest challenge because many other universities who are not so research-centered as we, in some sense, have an easier job. Um, and again, as part of the work I've done, and I know that's going on here, we're sort of nibbling around the edges on the laboratory. What can we do to here and there to improve things. I think what we really need to be seriously thinking about is a major study. We've got the people here at MIT who will volunteer their effort on the academic as well as the facility side to really think about what are some really major changes we can think about how both our future labs and our existing labs can increase their energy efficiency. In some little work that I've done and other people have done with just undergraduates, we found major mistakes going on in the labs, but I'm sure there are lots of new technical breakthroughs we could really think about if we broaden our horizons. And I would say that's one of the first challenges we need to do is get something started and actually fund these people so they're not doing a sort of a after hours kind of effort, but a major effort that they'll be doing students, faculty, staff 
to work on this kind of thing. And I would think if we don't get that started in the next year or two, we'll really be remiss in trying to meet some of the goals we're trying to have. So, so I, I agree with everything you're, you're saying in that regard, and I, and I would come back to say there's a lot of people out there that are doing this sort of as part-time or as a hobby within the lab or as an initiative or a program. It really needs to be somebody's core job. We have to make it people's responsibility. And, and I think that that's a question of maybe it's a governance issue that maybe a steering committee of some type can help really say, how do we really make it part of someone's responsibilities? Because the experience that I've had, as soon as something's your job, it's amazing, it gets done, right? <laughs> so, so it's how do you make a part of everyone's job sort of more formally? Um, and, and, and these are great questions to, to, to it kind of keeps it from this, how does it just become a part-time hobby and then it just kind of falls off after a couple of weeks. But it's really making it core to everything that we do at MIT every day.